me. He served in Iraq. One day, these guys came to our house and just told us something happened this morning. And I was seven. I didn't understand anything that was going on. And so after they left, my mom had to explain to me everything that happened. He was being transferred to different stations and they were driving and I believe he was the third or fourth vehicle. He drove over a box and an IED exploded on his vehicle. That was one of the questions, the many, many questions I have with God is why his vehicle? And he was the only man out of three guys in that vehicle that died. The other two survived. I believe that God brought me to this school so I could get a better relationship with Him and a stronger relationship with Him. Because once I came to Christian Community Schools, I just was convicted. We had chapel services every Thursday and I couldn't stay in there because I had to run out because I'd be like, why God? Why are you doing this to me? Why did you do this to me? And just one day, God said, picture me and lay it down at my feet and it'll all go away. And after that day, it's been like so much lighter and I understand it better. I've definitely struggles, like some memories will come flooding back about them and it'll have hard days and good days and you never know when they will be. There's several people that honor the military, but there's some people that don't and they don't really understand the sacrifices that they are going through. It's not just them overseas getting bullets shot at them. And they're, some of them are probably scared for their lives. I'm scared for all of them. But one thing like I've learned is that they are so brave, but the families that are left at home, hoping and praying every day that they got through it, that's what I pray for them a lot because that was so hard. And then to get that phone call or those people show up at your door and say, hey, he's gone or she's gone, that's probably like one of the hardest things. So the people that are praying and their families that are at home, I just say pray for them because it's probably the hardest position to be in. to introduce to you one of our own. If you've been a member of our church for long, you've met Brother Paul Lancaster. Brother Paul served in the U.S. Navy for 22 years. Uh, he was saved while serving our country. God called him to preach. You'll hear a little bit of his bow, a little bit of his testimony today. But then he was a pastor for 26 years. So we're privileged today to have someone who's been both a soldier for our country and a soldier for the Lord Jesus, a real soldier of the cross. And he's going to come today. I know you will be blessed. I want you to put your hands together, and let's welcome Brother Paul Lancaster uh, to the platform today. Brother Thank Paul. You. It's good to be here this morning on this Memorial Day. Uh, I think I was asked because of my time in the military to come and speak today, but that's fine. I'm just glad to be here. Nathan wore his uniform. He looks so sharp today. I'm glad that he's here. I heard him... I heard him say on uh, Tuesday night he was going to wear his uniform, and I thought, well, that's a good idea. So I thought, maybe I'll just wear mine. <laughs> you know where this is going, don't you? <laughs> you know what happens to your uniform after you hang it in the closet for 23 years? It shrinks. <laughs> the only part of my uniform that fits anymore is my hat and my shoes. They're the same size. <laughs> but it's good to be here this morning. Celebrating Memorial Day. Now, Brother Bob didn't help me out in this service. In the first service, he gave about half, first half of my message uh, by talking about Memorial Day. 
Uh, I knew a lot of answers. He should have known I'd done some research on it. And so uh, we, uh, we come to Memorial Day, and I'll just say this up front, that people relate to Memorial Day by how much they've got invested in it. You know, when you think about the, the lives that were invested in our nation in the Second World War, it's not the same as it is today. In the Second World War, there was sugar rationing, there was the, uh, rationing of, uh, of gasoline. The, you couldn't even get tires for your car because it was all going to the war effort. The women came out of the homes and began to work in the factories where men had been working. And so things changed in our nation significantly during the Second World War. And the, the people of that generation are really invested in Memorial Day. They remember the sacrifices that were made. They remember those buddies who died on, at Normandy and at other places uh, around the world during that Great World War. And as we think about Memorial Day, it should draw us to that thought of, of those who have sacrificed their life that we might enjoy the freedoms that we enjoy today as Americans. We need to remember that, that they gave the ultimate sacrifice. This thing cuts in and out, but I got a loud voice. Just hang in there. <clears throat> Going back to where Memorial Day came from, uh, it was, there were a few little towns around who were arguing about who started it. And so finally in 1966, Lyndon Johnson decided to come together and just, just settle it once and for all. Anybody know where it is? Brother, beside Brother Bob, I know he knows. Waterloo, New York is where they say the first Memorial Day was held. They actually set down the city. Uh, they had a big parade. They had a big celebration. And they, they've never quit that. They do it year after year, uh, celebrating Memorial Day. Memorial Day actually came about as a result of the Civil War. Civil War, we lost over 640,000 men on two sides. And that's the most that we've ever lost in any war. 140,000. The Second World War is a little over 400,000. First World War was about 26,000. 56 or so thousand in uh, Korea. 58,000 plus in Vietnam. So all these wars, uh, they actually, uh, we remember Memorial Day, but it came about because of what we lost in the, in the Civil War. And so as we, we think about that, this is really designed... Memorial Day is to remember all of the people who've lost their lives in all the world, the wars that our nation has ever fought. And don't forget that. It's to be different than Veterans Day. Veterans Day is a day when we remember all the veterans, all you guys who served. We appreciate each and every one of you. But today it's, it's focused on, this weekend it's focused on those who lost their lives in the service of our nation. Not to be confused with Veterans Day. Um, you know, uh, we're a very forgetful people, and this year marks the, the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. I was born shortly after that in 1948, but in 1945 is when World War II came to an end. Seventy years later, and it's a very vague memory uh, to some, and to some, they don't know what you're talking about when you talk about World War II today. And so 70 years removed. And the, the longer we're removed from something, the more we forget it. And so we have memorials created in our nation to remember these things. How many of you have been to Washington, D.C. and seen the memorials? What an awesome place to visit. You go there and you see the Jefferson Memorial, the Lincoln Memorial, the Washington Monument, but then you come to the war memorials, the memorials to the Second World War, Korean War, the Vietnam War, which I was a part of. And that's... that's uh, there for, to help us remember one of the most touching things I ever saw the first time I walked up to the Vietnam Memorial there was a young woman who was kneeling down at that memorial and she had a piece of paper and a pencil and she was scratching the name of the person that she had loved on that piece of paper and that goes on all the time I had tears in my eyes folks I'll have to admit to remember that one who she had lost I don't know if it was a husband, a brother, a father who it might have been but she had suffered loss, and she wanted to remember it. The most significant memorial that we have, to me, in Washington, D.C., is Arlington Cemetery. I used to work in D.C. at the Arlington Annex, and every morning and every afternoon, I drove by 
those rows of 400,000 plus graves all lined up neatly, all in a manicured place, of people who were privates to generals of the army, statesmen to presidents, lying in rest there. Men and women who gave their life for this nation, that we might enjoy the freedoms that we enjoy today. A very significant memorial. It touches me every time I see it. When I left uh, D.C., I retired from the Navy, and they gave me this personal memorial. This thing's kind of heavy, so I'll try to hold it up. This thing tells you a lot about my life. Now, my wife and I have been married for 45, going on 46 years. And in that time, I was in the military for 22 years. This tells you I was a Master Chief Dental Technician, that I was in for over 20 years. That's what those stripes, each one four years. This tells when I was advanced in rate through the chief ratings. But this one over here is what speaks to me. It's the one I remember. Judy and I moved 39 times in 22 years. A lot of moving around, folks. Join the Navy, see the world. I did. <laughs> this tells me where we got married because I was in the military for about a year when we got married. It tells me where my children were born. But more significantly, it tells me where I got saved. I got saved in Millington, Tennessee in 1971. Shortly after, we were transferred to Okinawa, Japan. Got really active in the church over there after I got saved. I became a music leader, believe it or not. <laughs> they were desperate. <laughs> <clears throat> then I, uh, then we, we transferred to Camp Pendleton, and I was with the Marines quite a bit because they don't have corpsmen and dental technicians. And so I was with the Marines at, at Camp Pendleton. Then I went to Great Lakes, Illinois, and... Uh, then we uh, transferred to Mayport, Florida, and then over to Rota, Spain, where we really got active in the church. And they had volunteer preachers that came in over there, and they didn't stay very long usually, and so wound up, I started preaching over there. And I didn't feel called to preach at that time. I was kind of arguing with God about that. <laughs> and so we come back to the States, and, and we wind up at my last duty station in Washington, D.C., and I went to a men's retreat one weekend, and I was leading the retreat. I was teaching on really being sold out to God. Guess who it spoke to? <laughs> I surrendered my life again to preach. And so since then, it's been a wonderful ride serving the Lord. The Christian nation that we have here, and I'll call it a Christian nation because it was founded on Christian principles, whether people like to admit it or not, and we need to remember that the freedoms that we have in our nation today, they're free, but they're not cheap. They've been paid for. They've been paid for by the lives of people. And the Bill of Rights that, that guarantees that we have this religious freedom, I thank God for it. Because without it, you can see where our world would be today. But I want to remind you this morning, when we think about all the morals that we have in our nation from from Washington, D.C. to the USS Arizona out in Pearl Harbor, on and on it goes, that God is also a God of memorials. Throughout the history of Israel and throughout the history of Christianity, God has established memorials. He established a, a memorial in creation. Did you realize that? It says He rested on the seventh day, and He said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The word memorial means to remember and so remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That's a memorial that we are to remember. We also see memorials throughout the history of the nation of Israel. The covenant that God made with Abraham, the memorial that signified that is circumcision. As we go through, we see Jacob was, uh, was raised by Isaac and Rebekah, raised in a, a godly home, and they talked about God all the time, but he didn't come to know God until he left home and met God at Bethel. And he, there were angels ascending and descending in a dream that he had. And he realized that this was significant, that he had, was no longer just a person who knew about God, but he was a person who knew God. God had spoken to him, and things had changed. And folks, I want, to know, want you to know today that God speaks to us too. He wants us to know him. He wants us to know he's a personal God. He's a real God, and he'll change your life. Even as he did Jacob's. When he met him at Bethel, mankind's forgiveness is why God is created, or forgetfulness is why God has created 
these memorials for us. So we will remember His covenant. So we'll remember His mighty work. So that we'll remember the promises that He's fulfilled and is yet to fulfill. A God of memorials. In the Old Testament, we see basically two types of memorials. One that God said create, and one that man chose to create because he had had an experience with God. Like the one that Jacob created at Bethel. I want you to turn with me this morning to the book of Joshua, chapter 4. And we see examples of both of these, time, these, these types of memorials. The memorial that God said you create, and one that, that Jacob or Joshua decided he wanted to create because he had come to know God as he had never known him before. Beginning with verse 1 of Joshua chapter 4. It says, Now it came to pass when all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan that the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the tribe, one man from each tribe, and command them, saying, Take up for yourselves twelve stones from out of here, of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet are standing, and carry them over with you, and lay them down in the lodging place where you will lodge tonight. Skip down to verse 9. It says, Then Joshua set up twelve stones in the middle of the Jordan at the place where the feet of the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant were standing, and they were there, they are there to this day. Then I want you to skip down to verse 19. It says, Now the people came up from the Jordan on the tenth of the first of the month and encamped at Gilgal on the, on, of the first month and encamped at Gilgal on the eastern edge of Jericho. These 12, those twelve stones which they had taken from the Jordan were set up at Gilgal. And he said to the sons of Israel, When your children ask your fathers in time to come, saying, What are these stones? Then you shall inform your children, saying, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry land. And the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed just as the Lord your God had done to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed. That all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, so that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Amen. We see that God gives this command to establish a memorial. God had dried up the Jordan, and it wasn't just an insignificant thing because the Jordan was at flood stage. It was outside its bank. And God said, when the, the feet of the priest touch the water, the waters will recede. The ground will be dry. One of the worst things that an army faces is muddy weather. Tanks get stuck. Jeeps get struck. Men get their feet wet. It's a terrible thing. I was, that's why I didn't go in the army, Nathan. I wanted to be on a ship. <laughs> dry land. Three good meals a day. All that stuff. So we see God does this wonderful miracle. And as they cross the Jordan, they get on the other side, God says, set up a memorial. I don't want you to forget this. He says, I want you to take 12 stones. These are not like the little stones that I would pick up and skip across the, the, the lake out there. These are big stones. These are stones that you're going to build into a memorial, and when people walk by, they're going to see it. So they, he picked some of the strongest men in Israel, the young men, out of the 12 tribes from each, each tribe, and they went back to where the priests were standing, they picked up large stones, put them on their shoulder, and they carried them up to where they were going to lodge that night. They were going to lodge at Gilgal. So as we, we see them take these stones and they carry them out, Joshua suddenly realizes, man, I have had an awesome experience with God. I have never experienced him like this before. I've seen the miracles he did with Moses and all these things, but God did this for me to elevate me in the sight of, of the people of Israel. God has built me up. He's put me on a plane with Moses. What a great and wonderful God I serve. He was just overflowing with joy. And so we see Joshua go and he picks up 12 stones on his own. God didn't tell him to do this, but he's had a significant experience with God. And he takes those 12 stones and he builds an, a, a significant monument there in the middle of the River Jordan, nobody's going to ever see it again. But I'll guarantee you, every time Joshua went by the River Jordan at that spot, he remembered what God had done. Amen. How often do you remember what God has done in your life? How often do you remember that God saved you sometime in the past? You may be 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 50 years ago, and it may have faded some in your mind. We need to be remembered to be reminded 
of what God has done. We need to go back to those times, but we don't want to dwell there. They crossed the River Jordan, and some significant things happened. Once they got across, the Jordan began to flow again at flood stage. Doors had been opened. Doors had been closed. No longer could they go back to the wilderness. No longer could they go back to Egypt. You know, a lot of times, folks, we get caught up in looking back at Egypt. We get caught up in looking back at what we've done, what the Lord has done, and we stay there. We don't move forward. Joshua was the man of faith. He walked by faith. He followed the Lord. What the Lord said, do, he did it. Henry Blackaby says in his study of experiencing God that you cannot stay where you're at and go with the Lord. You just can't do it. So we got to walk by faith. We got to put our faith in the, the God who moves mountains, the God who, who shakes the, 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 the seas and destroys things. We need to remember that we have got to follow the Lord in all that we do Amen. and to keep following Him Amen. and walk by faith. In the New Testament, God continues to establish memorials. His Son, Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, established two memorials that are God-designed. And then man has established a memorial, I'm going to mention at the end of this, that uh, I've got some problems with, but it's there. The first memorial that, he, that Christ established is known as the Lord's Supper. I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 22 for just a moment. It came near the end of Christ's life. And he calls his disciples. He said, I want to, to, to participate in this supper with you. It was the Passover. I want to participate with this with you one more time. Now, you've got to remember that Christ is a Jewish man. He's been participating in the Lord's Supper every year, year after year, ever since he was a baby. Something was different about this one. That's why it's written so much about in the New Testament. There were some significant things going to happen here. He says, go and find a man who's carrying a pitcher and ask him where the, where the room is for the master to have this final supper with. Go and prepare that room. He said, I want to enjoy this supper with you. And so as we come to this, we see some very significant things. First of all, <clears throat> We see Christ at this supper do something you don't normally do at a Seder meal. He got up from the table. They weren't paying a whole lot of attention to him. But he got up from the table, and he girded himself with a towel, and he took a basin of water, and he went around, and he began to wash the feet of his disciples. And he said, as he did this, you do likewise. I'm teaching you. Ever the teacher, Christ is teaching even to the end. And so he says, I want you to remember the humility that I had as your master as I knelt before you and I washed your feet. And Peter said, well, why don't you wash all of me, Lord? He said, I don't need to do that. You should have washed yourself before you came. I just need to wash the dust off your feet. Teaching them humility, he said, you do the same. Serve others hum humbly as you walk. The second thing that he did is there was a man there who was going to betray him, and he knew that. And as Judas reclined at the table next to Christ, Christ whispered to him, what you do, go and do it quickly. And Judas left. And then the Lord did something really significant, something I think the, the disciples were totally unprepared for. Look with me in Luke chapter 22, beginning with verse... And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. When he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. When he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way he took the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you, listen to this, is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus said, I did not come to destroy the Old Testament. I did not come to destroy the law. What did he say he came to do? 
I came to fulfill the law. At this point in time, the law was fulfilled. It was done. A new covenant was about to be started. Christ was about to implement what we know as the New Testament. The word covenant means testament. And so as, as Christ comes to this point in the Lord's Supper, in the Passover, He establishes that the, He has come and He has completely fulfilled the law. The only one that could, the sinless Son of God, fulfilled the law. Amen. It was done. It was complete. Yes. They said nobody could do it. Christ did it. Amen. He said, now we start something new, guys. This is a new covenant, and it's in my blood. You see, the old covenant was sealed in the blood of goats and of sheep. But the new covenant was shed in the perfect lamb of God's blood. Shortly after this, he was going to go to the cross of Calvary, and he was going to die there, and he was going to shed his blood, and he was going to pay the penalty that you and I should have to pay for our own sins. Because he did that, we don't have to anymore. Praise the Lord and hallelujah. And so we see Christ implements what we know as the Lord's Supper. He says, do this in remembrance of me. So each and every time that we come to this great memorial established by Christ, we are to remember what Christ did for us as he suffered the beatings and the crowns being pressed into his, his brow, going to the cross and, and, and the lashes and all those things that he suffered on our behalf. We need to remember that. Paul said in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that some slept because they had taken of the Lord's Supper inappropriately. They had been abusing it. It means they had died as a result of abusing the Lord's Supper. We need to come to it, remembering the significance of it and who implemented it. We need to, be, to keep it, it treasured and holy within our lives. A second memorial that he created is the act of baptism. It's such a beautiful picture of what God has done for someone. It is the first testimony of a person who's become a believer in Jesus Christ. I love to watch people being baptized. I love the way Grace Park celebrates people being baptized. I love to stand and give a standing ovation to someone whose life has been changed. I get excited about that. I mean, I hadn't been in many churches that do that. Stand up and give somebody a standing ovation because their life has been changed, and we should give it to them. They deserve it. They've made a great decision. Their life will never be the same. The act of baptism is such a beautiful picture of what God has done for us, what Christ did for us. When you go into those baptismal waters and you're baptized by immersion, you're selling the, telling the world, I have died to that old sinful self. I put it to death. And that picture of putting a person under the water is a picture of burial. That old self has been buried. That rising out of the water is a picture of resurrection, folks. It's a new life. Praise the Lord. It's a, it's a resurrection. We have died to the old self. We've been resurrected to walk in a newness of life, to walk with the Lord, to become a disciple of His, and to follow after Him. And as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, to go and to do the works that God has prepared beforehand so we might work in them, walk in them. Amen. Amen. Raised to a newness of life, to walk in the good works that God has prepared for us from the foundation of the world. Amen. Christianity is such an amazing, amazing religion because yeah. there's a living God Amen. and we have the resurrection to look forward to and we have these symbols that Christ has given to us to remember done these things for us and he's going to fulfill the promises that he's made a third promise that we see or a third memorial that we see among Christianity today is the cross now I want to just share with you that I have a problem with, with crosses that have Christ hanging on them because Christ isn't there I have a problem with those who, who, uh, who look at the cross and think Christ is still on that cross no he isn't he died for my sins he was buried he's not in the tomb either Where's Christ today? 
He's in heaven at the right hand of the Father. He's interceding for you and I. He couldn't do that from the cross. He couldn't do that from the tomb. He's, on the, he's in, the, in heaven sitting at the right hand of God. When I don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit takes my prayers to him. Praise God. We have a living Savior. But people, for some reason, came up with the cross to be a symbol that would remind them of their Christianity. I have seen that cross in places I, wouldn't want, I don't want to see that cross. People wear that around their neck and they're doing all kinds of ungodly things. That's terrible to me. It breaks my heart. You know, I don't believe the Lord really would have wanted the cross to be the symbol. I think the Lord would like to have a symbol for the resurrection. That's what's important. You know, it's, it was important that Christ died, but without the resurrection, we got no hope. You know, Paul dealt with this in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he said, you know, if, if there ain't no resurrection, we've called God a liar. We have no hope. We praise God that Christ died. We praise God that he was resurrected. The cross reminds us that Christ did go there, that he did shed his blood, that that blood sealed this covenant that he created the New Testament that we now live under. We call that the age of grace. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 says, without the shedding of blood, there's no redemption. There's no forgiveness of sin. The Father required the blood of a perfect lamb to be shed for your sin and for my sin. I couldn't do it. I wasn't perfect. God was. Christ was. I, I preach a sermon where I talk about four pillars of Christianity. The virgin birth of Christ, his perfect sinless life, his death on the cross, and his resurrection. Take any of them away, there's no Christianity, guys. Christ died for our sins. And we praise God for that. He took the place that I should have, paid, should have taken. He paid the penalty that I should have paid. But there's a passage in here, there's a, there's a little kind of afterthought that's thrown in in one of these passages of Scripture. It says, Christ died for many. He died for many. John 3.16 says he died for the whole world. So what's the difference? The difference is, is that some will receive him and some won't. He died for many. He died for all. But not all will receive. Not all will believe in Jesus Christ. You know what happens if you don't believe in Christ? If you don't receive him as your personal Savior? You pay the penalty yourself. Someday you'll stand at the great white throne judgment. And someday God will judge you for rejecting his Son. And he will cast you into the lake of fire. And I don't think anybody wants to go there. I want to encourage you this morning, folks. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, make this a special memorial day. This will be a day that you can look back on your life and say, wow, that was a special weekend. I received Christ as my personal Savior. I can always look back at that day and remember it because it happened on Memorial Day weekend. I will never, ever forget it. God wants to change your life today. He showed his love for you by shedding his blood on the cross of Calvary and bringing into effect a new covenant that is called the covenant of grace. Grace means you receive something you don't deserve, guys. Freely from God. None of us deserve that kind of love. But he loves you. If you've never experienced that love, I want to encourage you to come this morning and to give your life to Christ and celebrate a new beginning.